this episode was originally recorded in February 2021. In today's show, I speak to John O'Grady and we discuss a timeless leadership lesson, which is the need to cultivate a culture of trust and purpose. John has developed a trust framework and a trust equation, and he shares his view that leadership is a human contact sport and also some important stats on what happens when you have a culture of trust. Listen up to the rest of the conversation as we discuss the maverick nature of engendering trust and what the military can learn from business. The Maverick Paradox at KLDR is a weekly conversational show that explores maverick leadership in all its guises, showcasing what it is to be an effective maverick leader with experts in diverse fields. To survive and thrive in this complex, fast-moving world, we need effective maverick leaders who are change-eager, able to strategize, innovate, and execute, and are able to work for the greater good with integrity, empathy, and passion. Judith Germain has been defining mavericks as willfully independent people since 2005 and champions divergent thinking and the ability to execute. The Maverick Paradox is for the pathologically curious. Come and join us. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today our guest is John O'Grady. Hi John. Hi, how are you, Judith? Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. No, I'm fine, thank you. And you? Well, yeah, doing well. A little rainy here in the uh, U.S. right now. <laughs> I know, it's raining on and off here. It's kind of a weird climate thing that we're going through yeah. right now. Um, I'm really interested in talking to you about your views on leadership. But before we do that, can you tell me about you? Sure. Um, so... Uh, Born and raised in New York, uh, went to the United States Military Academy where I was a Division One athlete playing uh, the sport of lacrosse. Uh, graduated there and went on to a career in the military, which if you would have asked me when I entered the academy or even when I graduated the academy, if I would have spent an entire career or at least you know my first career uh, in the military, I would have laughed at you and said no way um <laughs> there there it is you know uh, a number of years later with a full military career and it was uh fabulous uh challenging rewarding uh don't regret one bit of it and uh have recently started my own leadership consulting service so grady leadership consulting services uh very original there <laughs> and um Says what really you on the sharing team. yeah sharing uh you know my experiences as a not only a division one athlete but also uh all the experience over an entire career of leading young men and women both in peacetime and in combat um with uh either corporations and sports teams both mm, interesting I know from your LinkedIn profile that it talks about your timeless leadership message, but he doesn't yep. say what that is. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, uh, the biggest one in my fundamental message is one about cultivating a culture of trust. Oh, yeah. Uh, that is really, to me, the, the complete essence and foundation. And if, if organizations, executive teams, uh, coaches of sports teams – that are high performing and high potential want to gain a uh, competitive advantage, uh, cultivating a culture of trust with intention and purpose is one of the best ways to go about doing that. I agree. Um, that's such a mainstay for the stuff that I talk about in terms of maverick leadership, that trust is, is right there as the, as if you don't have trust, you don't have anything. And mm -hmm. I feel that, for example, Mavericks don't, they won't work with it. They won't go anywhere if they don't trust you. Um, uh -huh. And I think that it's similar 
for people who aren't mavericks, but certainly having trust and leadership is the only way forward. How, how would you, is there a methodology that you would use to build trust or is it more a philosophy? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a pragmatic uh, tool uh, that I applied, uh, well, first developed over a number of years, probably mm-hmm. about 20 um, in total, uh, as I modified, iterated, et cetera, and learned from others uh, who I worked with and for. Um, and, you know, the fundamental thing is, you know, like you said, we all intuitively get that trust is uh, fundamental, foundational, and, and vitally important to any relationship, whether it be person to person on an individual level, uh, an individual to a corporation, um, a corporation to stakeholders, to constituencies, to clientele, on and on and on. We all agree. Nobody ever says, oh, trust, that's overrated. You know, forget <laughs> that, right? Yeah. But then, it, then we never talk about it again, really. Yeah, or no one don't do it. Yeah, it was deeply frustrating to me, um, except for uh, when it's either very close to being broken um, and and in an irrevocable, uh, irreparable state. Um, then we then we bring it back up again. You know, I'm like, well, what about the huge space in between? I mean, if it's that important. You know, for the love of God, we got to do something about this. And so I developed what I call a trust framework. And uh, one of the foundational parts of it, it's it's multi-component. Um, it's a presentation I do. It's about a 30 to 45 minute presentation. It can be followed up with a workshop. But the the fund foundational component of the trust framework is a trust equation. Um, and what I found with but with that is we start giving people the vocabulary and the words and by unpacking this idea of trust, right? Because if you, if you ask an audience and when I, when I do the presentation, I'll ask an audience, you know, Hey, take a minute or two at the tables, talk to the person next to you and, you know, provide the three to four sentence definition of trust. And it's like, people can't do it. Yeah. Because because they associate it with a feeling, and and rightfully so. I'm not suggesting that that's incorrect, right? But yeah. if we can't get it beyond the sense of a feeling, how are we ever going to cultivate it with intention and purpose? And yeah. so by unpacking trust into this equation, it helps to do that. And I'm happy to share that my equation, at least with you now, if you'd like. Yeah, definitely. I'm sitting there pen poised. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I, the way I, I present it, and again, I, I offer this is my equation. This is one that I have used, again, training in combat um, and then helped with sports teams and corporations in my private practice now. Um, it is trust equals uh, honesty or, or integrity. You could, you know, in those two words, I don't want to parse it out too finely, but w- either one of those two plus competence, plus uh, dependability, or again, you could use another word, reliability maybe, some people prefer that, plus genuine care. And what I mean by genuine care is, is there's not this sense of coddling or anything associated like that. It's a, it's a in whatever relationship this is, so let's say it's a, a person uh, who has 10 direct reports, it is, I am as invested in you 10 people and, and our collective success and your individual success as you are mine. There's this symbiotic, genuine care for one another's well-being and fulfillment. And that's the equation. And once you unpack it, you can start to discreetly talk about different parts of that in your day-to-day um, dealings with people. Mm. I like that, especially the genuine care, because that's one of the things that really surprises me. Like if I do leadership training, for example, or consultant, and I say, you know, to be a maverick leader, you've got to really care about your team. And everyone goes, yeah, goes, no, you literally need to care. So whether they're going for a divorce or they're not feeling well, you know, you should be, you should, you know, you have to care. Um, but sometimes right. people look at you like, but why is that important? <laughs> yeah. Because if yeah. you don't care, you know, if someone doesn't care about you, why do you want to slug your guts out for that individual? If they don't care about you. What's the sure. 
Yeah, I mean, leadership at the end of the day, maverick or otherwise, is is a uh, it's a human uh, a human contact sport. <laughs> it's, Ooh, it's like, like that. to refer to that. Yeah, I like that a human contact sport. Yeah, you know, you can't shy away from things, right? You got to be able to willing to get in there and get up the close and you know, personal. I mean, we are respecting you know, personal boundaries, clearly, um, you know, it, you know, emotional, physical, and otherwise, but, um, you know, it, it, yeah, it's not, it's not this thing that's to be observed from a distance. Yeah. And also if you're trusted, then things happen quickly, don't they? I mean, Stephen Covey talks about the speed of trust and yeah. the trust tax and you are taxed but if you're if you're not trusted, so it takes longer for people to believe you to move into action. And when you're trusted, it happens very, very quickly. You um, bet. Yeah. And I think it's a shame that you have to spell it out because it should be one of those truisms. It should be just self-evident. Yeah, you're, you're right. And I find a lot of, um, you know, uh, I guess a barrier to entry, so to speak, in, in, the, in my field of, of working with uh, executive team and again, coaches uh, of, of sports teams and their people um, is lots of times I, if, if I have to sell you know, what I'm bringing um, too hard, then I've learned that they're not for whatever reason, they're just not ready. And it's not mm-hmm. worth me trying to go hard sell on them because it's going to be me dragging them along the entire way, right? And that's not beneficial for anybody. Um, and so one of the things, though, that I have figured out is this so notion of, you know, people always want, like, well, what's the return on investment? You yeah. know, I'm going to pay you, you know, X amount of dollars to come in and, you know, give this cultivating, you know, culture of trust presentation. And then you're going to, you know, do a follow it up with a workshop. And then you're going to follow up with, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, providing advice and, and uh, consulting work with the executive team, maybe. So it, it was, it's great. Uh, Harvard Business Review has already helped me with that. And so there was an article in Harvard Business Review, and they specifically uh, talk about these longitudinal studies that not only they did, but Google and the Aristotle Project and some others, and compared with people at low trust companies people at high trust companies report 74% less stress, 106% more energy at work, 50% higher productivity, 13% fewer sick sick days, 76% more engagement, which means clearly less personnel turnover, which is a huge, you know, expenditure and loss of of, of money for companies, 29% more job satisfaction and satisfaction overall with their lives and 40% less burnout. Now, I can't tell you what that means for a tech company versus Amazon versus a, you know, Mayflower moving company and on and on. But those numbers, I don't know any executive who wouldn't kill for just one or two of those metrics. And then they could figure out what the dollar sign, you know, equivalent is in, for the context of their, you know, business, right? Uh, so thanks to uh, Harvard Business Review for helping me hopefully get a little more explicit with some people who are kind of like, well, you know, trust. Yeah, I get it. It's important. But I don't know if we really have the time to spend to really, oh, okay, well, <laughs> don't trust me. Trust Harvard Business Review. Yeah, it's interesting because I've increasingly over time st- of been training trust, how to engender trust in others and and how to get trust back in part of leadership programs. And I'm doing a a local government program that I've put together. And in it, there is a module on, you know, a whole half day, just talking just on trust. Mm -hmm. And I think people are being driven to see trust as not just a soft skill, but the hard skill that you're talking about because the people that are now working organizations are demanding that you are trustworthy before they work with you or go anywhere. And I think that's more 
of a new phenomenon in the numbers of people. So Mavericks have always been like, uh huh, no. <laughs> Whereas I think right. now it, it's, it's a larger number of, you know, you're talking about whole swathes of the population who are like, I can always go and work somewhere else. Yep, I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and you know, um, and, you know, and then again, you just take the human component out of it, which I, I don't like to do um, yeah. because that's really what my passion is, right? It's about people, mm. you know, but sometimes when I'm talking to these executives, I mean, in today's world, um, there is such an amount of transparency, whether you want it or not. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so if there's things going on inside your, your organization that don't naturally um, elicit trust, um, that's going to come out eventually, sooner yeah. or later. And when it does, it's likely going to be a massive PR nightmare and a great loss of revenue will be bled out over a time and period far longer than you ever wanted. And so just from a dollar standpoint, it makes sense because you can either spend money trying to hide, cover up, protect, et cetera, right? Or you can spend time, energy, and money to an extent by bringing in someone like me or others, right, whoever, to help you get to a place where you, you don't have to worry about those types of things. And even if they do happen, because bad things do happen to good people and good organizations from time to time, you have such a strong culture of trust that it serves as an inoculant against those types of uh, one-off uh, events. Yeah, it's a bit like years ago when I was working in HR and you know, somebody would say, X manager did this or X employee did that. And then you'd obviously you have all the evidence or, or not, but then you'd also but there'd be a time when you'd stop and you go, okay, all that aside, is that to the nature of this individual? Can I actually see that happening? You know, and, and it makes a difference between, well, everything that I know about this person suggests no. This so let's just check to make sure. It's not a malicious allegation, for example. Or everything I know about this person is like, it's likely. So let's check yeah. to see, you know, and, and it, it, it's it's not about a case of going with gut feel, because that's not necessarily what I'm saying here, but it's that your reputation as an individual will always stand by you and it will protect, as you said, when there are allegations against you that, you know, that are untrue. People may initially believe that because that's down to the, the influence of the other person or the of the weight of the crowd but over yeah. time when all that emotion's gone it's like i can't see john doing that you yeah. know it just right. doesn't seem right let me just do a bit more digging you bet you bet yep and that's, absolutely that's the same a large organization i notice it says uh, um that you believe in a value-based leadership is that part of the trust is that in addition to the trust is there other values that are important yeah and so um i think uh the you know the trust you know part of that trust equation um does speak to the things you value you know uh the most potentially um but you know really values to me um are are uh they're not people sometimes will equate them with convictions right yeah. Um, and to me, that's helpful because uh, the the values and the convictions uh, are less likely to change without strong reason, factual yeah. based reason. Right. You know, like when I was a kid, I actually believed in, you know, OK, children out there cover cover your ears parents this is a you know a, a warning <laughs> you know i i believed deeply in santa claus i mean that was a conviction i had right <laughs> less so now 
So, you know, it's not that this, you know, it's this immovable object, but man, it took, it took a little while for me to kind of really come around to the notion that there is no Santa Claus. And I'm not going to tell you how old I was when that actually happened. Um, it was last year, wasn't end, it, John? Yeah, yeah, right. You might end the podcast like now, um, you know, but, but values are that, that thing, you know, and oftentimes, especially in today's world, um, I see executive teams, young, younger leaders in an organization get swayed by emotion, mm. right? And I always tell people in that moment, go back and ask yourself, is this emotion aligned with my values and what I am, what my convictions are? Because those are less likely to be swayed by the current trade winds and, and you know, fair weather nature of the day that makes a lot of sense one of the things about socialized mavericks is that they're very much principle based and they understand themselves quite well so they mm -hmm. will stand with those principles and it's harder to sway someone that knows themselves and one of the things about socialized mavericks is that they value their ability to analyze and be objective in their thinking process so that often means that if they're persuaded with a good argument of something against what they hold to be true they will let go of what they hold to be true if they're presenting with an argument that's good enough so there's no ego in it so it's kind of like i've always believed that the sun rose in the north <laughs> and they go, yeah. well let me just show you this and he's like okay i now believe right. <laughs> you know, and if and, th and there's no shame in it there's no like oh i have to fight this argument it's like oh cool i'm no longer a bit of an idiot now i kind of know something better so that's kind of cool i like that um where i find that other people um who are not that persuasion will not go with the truth and will not be objective because they have their identity invested in the opinion whereas the socialized maverick has their identity invested in the truth whatever yeah. wherever that might come out to be yeah yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, when you talk about Mavericks. Uh, so when I, I uh, part of what I do, I, I look at I, I basically look at four um, persona uh, archetypes, uh, Maverick, um, Pioneer, Operator and Reconciler. And uh, it's interesting uh, when you look at uh, Google as a as a business example or a case study of this, um, you know, its founders, Larry Page and, and Sergey Brin, um, you know, were a, uh, you know, Page was like the maverick, I think, and, and, and Brin was the pioneer. And, you know, great ideas, um, uh, but they ran into some difficulties early on, right? Especially in terms of some of their internal uh, organizational structure and um, getting along with people, et cetera. And as Google was cash strapped and failing, uh, one of the main reasons was this imbalanced top management team. You had this pioneer and this maverick at the top who were able to conceive of this idea, Google, and whose brains were running at a million miles an hour, but you didn't have that underpinning to really make it uh, pull off. And um, eventually the investors, you know, said, hey, look, you're bringing in somebody, and it was Eric Schmidt, right? Mm. And he was the he was the chief operating officer, and he he was the uh, the detail oriented, you know, deep business expertise guy. And then Schmidt ends up bringing in John Rosenberg, who was a, you know, who was an operator, uh, exceptional, you know, detailed planning, synchronization, holding people accountable for results on a on timelines, right? And that and once that team got rounded out. That's when Google really took off. And a lot of people don't, you know, it's like most things, you know, people think like overnight successes or overnight yeah. when really it was a lot longer than one night. Um, and it was some struggles. Uh, and Google's a great example, I think, of it. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, because I certainly remember, because um, I'm old enough, those early search engines and the Google wasn't all that good. Right. It wasn't yeah. that good and, at and all. And they were, compared they, to were. they were struggling, um, you know, uh, you know, both uh, Pages and Bryn, um, they, you know, they, they shared, you know, again, this passion for grand ideas, you know, fierce intellectual exchanges, um, improving humanity, 
uh, but their communication style was often, you know, blunt and aggressive, uh, <laughs> which kind of, you know, didn't help in terms of, um, uh, you know, some of the people that they had brought on uh, for the, the rest of the team. And again, you know, balance, the, the importance of balanced executive teams uh, is, is really um, an interesting case study with Google. Yeah, I agree. I'm wondering, though, how do you put in a values based culture and how does an organization know it's the right values? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it, it comes from a number uh, of ways and um, it depends. Right. So if you're talking about a, a, an organization that's, that's been around for a minute, uh, like, mm-hmm. take let's say, the U.S. Army, something I'm familiar with. Uh, those are deeply, deeply embedded, and those are ingrained from day one, and people are getting inculcated with the Army values literally from day one. Uh, and what you find is if at some point an individual doesn't start to internalize those along a spectrum of internalization, right, mm-hmm. uh, towards the higher end, that they are not going to succeed inside that organization. They, they will ultimately fail um, and they will be either, uh, they'll, they'll either self-select out or they'll be selected out, one of the two. If you're looking at like a startup, a younger company, um, again, I think it's important that, um, you know, when you're doing, you know, so let's say I work, I, I do some work with venture capital, uh, as an example, and the advice that I would provide to them, um, lots of times you have these these startups that tend to be very uh, technically proficient, the people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they, relatively speaking, they lack some of the leadership uh, skills and management skills. And so helping them think through truly what that value proposition is and what values they are going to anchor that organization in regardless of the invariable um, inevitable um, you know bumpy road uh, that'll occur as they go from initial startup through initial growth through you know full growth uh, and scaling Uh, and thinking through what that looks like going forward in the future and taking some time up front to do that is critically important and then having a way to make sure that as you are onboarding people, they understand it. I go into all sorts of places and there's all sorts of words and stuff all over the wall about, you know, values and everything else. And you ask somebody, you know, and they have no clue, you know, not, not a clue, which just tells me you're not being intentional and purposeful about it. You know, it was probably one MBA class that you th- you think you remember back in, you know, your second, you know, semester of your first year of MBA. You had to do a project and you and three people spent all night coming up with a vision, a mission and, uh, you know, a couple of key value words that you're going to present to your classmates the next day. And then somehow that like you were reminded of that at some point and you were like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, we need to come up with that now again because we're starting our business. And then that's it. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be purposeful, and you got to move forward with, with with that. Yeah, because the values, whether it's um, an individual or an organization, is the nature of the beast, isn't it? And yeah. you shouldn't need to tell people what the values are. I mean, in terms of customer, the customer should be able to see it. Right. You know? uh, whether it's an internal customer or an external one, you shouldn't need to say. I'm I'm a person of integrity because it should be self-evident that you are, (laughs) you know. um, You bet. Yeah, it's almost like you need to be happy to defend it. So I think part of it is leadership is a is is part of leadership is like aligning, isn't it? The uh, the individuals' values with the organisational values. Um, Yeah. But it's that I think sometimes people see aligning as in like. You will know what it is and you'll be able to spell it out and that's the way it is rather than saying, how can I take these values which we hold dear and make sure you are comfortable with also holding that 
So, you know, is there a way of interpreting these values so they fit your value? So it might be, I don't know, your value is honesty, company values honesty, but my highest value is integrity. And then you sure. show me how honesty and integrity are similar enough for me mm-hmm. to be comfortable accepting it. But it's like people are unwilling to do the hard work with every because like leadership's individual now isn't it so you have yeah. to individually do it with every individual that you have and people aren't quite as willing to do that these days yeah you know an, another great one is you know loyalty right mm. i love that one that that one i just i just love when i see that one because uh you know i'll ask the executive team okay like you know loyalty you know explain that a little bit more for me And it usually ends up being something like, well, you know, loyalty to the company, loyalty to the firm, loyalty to our mission, loyalty to our values, you know, et cetera, right? Yeah. And then you go ask, like, you know, one of the the lower, uh, you know, people down the chain, so to speak, and you ask them, like, oh, loyalty, you know what? You know, and it's like, well, you know, loyalty to my, you know, fellow coworkers, loyalty to, you know, uh, the, the people who work underneath me, below me, right? And all of a sudden you start seeing, Okay, both are both are living the loyalty value, but the outcome is potentially significantly different because the person who is a few rungs down on the leadership ladder didn't once mention anything about loyalty to the company. Yeah. And so if you ever think there's maybe a ethical dilemma that occurs, right? Where do you think that person's going to, you know, act in accordance with? Right. Probably their coworker and not the corporate value system and vice versa. Uh, So it's really interesting when you start really peeling these things back and really getting people to think about it and then talk about it so that there's a common shared understanding. Without that common shared understanding, again, those are just words up on a board or on a wall or on a piece of paper and nothing more. Yeah, I find that really interesting because you've kind of given me some, you've brought out some insight in that kind of, you say those ethical dilemmas, because quite often people don't want to feel loyal to the company because the company has betrayed them in some way, right. but they have to work there so to, <laughs> because they need the money. So the only way to assuage that cognitive dissonance is to put the loyalty with the team. So right. if something is happening, it doesn't even have to be, you know, unethical or criminal, but it's just, you know, I can I can help my buddy out here or I can work later and help the company there. Well, you know, I'll go babysit or <laughs> because I'm with these people every day and they understand me and you're just taking from me. Right. And then when you probably sit down and you do those performance reviews and people go but I am loyal because you know I was there when so and so was overworked I did their work for them and the company's like yeah but you didn't stay you didn't work late last Friday it's like no no but I did stay on Thursday and did that person's work you know mm-hmm. so they, so it's it's interesting I haven't really thought about that but I like that that's a really good distinction yeah yeah that's one that I think most people kind of get and then it helps them understand like oh, okay maybe we need to really deeply reevaluate all our things that we say we value um, and what does it mean to everybody? Yeah. I knew somebody who used to say, he works in another company and he said, the companies that spend a lot of time telling you about their values and make the biggest splash about them on their websites are the ones that show it the least. And I, when I first heard that, I was actually horrified. And then I did my own kind of like antidotal research. I was like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's like, maybe it's easier to talk about it than it is to yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's that's cool. So you obviously been in the military for uh, a long time, and so therefore you would have led in peacetime and in wartime. Mm-hmm. Is it similar, or is it quite different? Do some things fall away when there's war? I mean, there's I mean, in terms of right, you're in a unit that's actively fighting as opposed to <coughs> you know. yeah. So. Um... This is true really with, I think, leadership in general. There are fundamental principles that are, um, you know, relatively immutable uh, Mm -hmm. when it comes to being a uh, quality leader of uh, 
that that brings positive value, right? Because Lord knows there are enough leaders throughout history that um, one could argue had leadership skills, but were for all the wrong, uh, you know, reasons in terms of the way they were, um, you know, demonstrated and employed and very negative uh, values and outcomes uh, came from that, unfortunately. Um, and so what changes isn't necessarily the leadership principles, it's how they are implemented. Uh-huh. Right. That, that kind of is the, the nuance, right? It's kind of like um, when people, people talk about, I, I like to talk about fundamentals. Like, so there are certain fundamentals that are, that are kind of present with, with all good leadership. Um, and it's the intention and attention that's given to those uh, that are most helpful. And what you find in combat lots of times is those tend to get accentuated and, and heightened. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also not a, a, a light switch either, right? So leadership is a practice. I mean, mm. I've been studying and practicing leadership, and each day I am constantly inquisitive and seeking and looking for new ideas, uh, new ways to think about it, because I know that it is a continuing practice and I'll never have all the answers, especially as the world becomes more complex, right? Especially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's really cool. So what is one thing that the military can teach organizations and one thing that they can learn from yeah. other organizations. So I think, um, pro- you know, one of the things is the word discipline, right? <laughs> Lo- lots of times people tend to like be like, oh, discipline, ah, right? But really, uh, you know, we don't, at least I don't, I haven't practiced it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in being disciplined in, in, in the things that we do. Um, because it is a little bit like uh, trust in terms of when you were talking about uh, the Stephen Covey book and how trust creates, you know, speed of action. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a trust tax, right? And so, yeah. you know, all this extra energy that's going to have to go into getting something done if there's low trust versus high trust, et cetera. The, 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 there are similar parallels with discipline. Discipline actually creates the opposite I think of what a lot of people tend to think people think discipline is like controlling and and very limiting and no really once you're in a high discipline organization you realize that there's it it, it opens up the gate to um, incredible freedom of action and speed of action and um, and a, a common understanding of how things are being done even when we're not in the same physical space uh, and so discipline, I think, in that sense, could can be brought over to the business world and provide a competitive advantage. Yeah, that makes sense. And what would the military learn? From business? Mm. Um, what would the military... <laughs> that's a long list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um what would the military learn from business? Um, I think um, not uh, not being intellectually lazy. Mm. I, I uh, and I don't want to sound too harsh, but there there are times in the military where uh, because it is such a traditions based organization, because um, We are deeply uh, values-based. At times, I think we can become a little bit intellectually lazy. And in the business world, I think there's a greater price to pay and a more immediate price to pay and a clearer cause and effect that's able to be um, teased out um, in in the civilian world than there might be in the military world. So that would be one thing I I would offer. Mm, interesting great i think we're almost at an end so i've got a question for you um how has your own leadership changed since you started running your own business yeah um so uh 
So a couple of ways. Um, the first way that I'm still uh, there's still a tension, and I and I kind of settled on the fact that there likely always be this tension. Um, is I love again my passion is working with high potential and high performing uh, individuals and organizations, and and being with them on a journey. Uh, of their own kind of self awareness, right? Because these, these high performing and high potential people already have the answers for the most part within them. You know, mm. I'm just the guy who's helping them shine the light a little more specifically and a little more intentionally and purposely to get them to the answers, their own answers a lot quicker um, than they might otherwise get there. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I love that because I, I learn from them as well when I'm in these situations and I, I'm, and it's where I'm when it truly is in those moments that I'm most like alive. Right. Um, and so there's a selflessness that was, uh, you know, played out in the military and, uh, it also plays out now. I have a natural, sense of just wanting to be inside that experience but i have to be from a business standpoint right yeah i would do that for free yeah you know what i mean but i can't <laughs> <laughs> i know so, you mean. yeah you know really laying down what my value line is um outside of some extra extraordinary circumstances where there may be a pro bono or um you know work with uh you know a particular organization that's really doing some really great work um, in a socially responsible way, you know, and I can see the benefit far beyond just me and that organization on, in society, um, that I struggle with that still. So that, that's something I think that, that I'm, I'm, I'm still working with and adapting and morphing and growing. Yeah, it can be difficult because I find that you spend some time with the leadership team and you really care about each and every one of those mm -hmm. and then you have to leave. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of like... But, you know, it, it, yeah, you don't I, think that's really, I think that's probably the hardest because like, when you work in an organisation, then you're there for the time that either you or they are there, isn't it? But when you come in and you do something, no matter how long it lasts, then you have to go and they're still, you know, you kind of still want to be there. Right. Um, because you care about them. So, yeah, you that's bet. not tough. You bet. Yep, that's always difficult. And it's quite interesting because other people in the same field this year go... You know, when the money stops, then you just leave. It's just like, don't you really? Because I, I find that um, the people I work with become friends. And, it, yeah. You know, so you, you stay in touch, don't you? Because, you know, you genuinely care about what's happening, you know. So did you ever work that problem out? You know, are you okay? And that kind of stuff. But there's other times people look at you and go, like, you know, they paid you to do this or deliver that and it's finished. You move on. It's just like, oh. You bet. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Just seems I just maybe it just doesn't fit my own value because I think you make a commitment to the group of people or the individual you're working with, and just because you stop being paid doesn't mean you can't phone in six months' time just to check in to make sure everything's all right. I mean, what does it cost you, right? Right. To do that? So. Oh, I I agree a hundred percent. And uh, you know, in in one case, I even found that you know, despite my not I was doing that, not seeking any additional necessarily um you know. Uh, work or, or payment. Yeah, it's or not a marketing call. It's a genuine. No, care. it wasn't. It was. It was yeah. truly uh, genuine. Um, but it ended up actually turning into like a, a another, um, you know, paying opportunity too. Um, you know, which is always nice when you're when you're out there just being authentic, being or genuine, not necessarily seeking um, anything particular in return, but it comes to you anyway. Um, it, it's kind of affirmation that, that something in the world is, is working right <laughs> yeah I had somebody like that actually it was a it, it was a small business client and um, he needed something done um, and it was between me and another provider and he said why should you do this piece of work and I said well you you know you really know about me in terms of you know what I can and can't do I said but I genuinely care whether you achieve this or not and it was a bit of a pause. And then he said, you know what, from everything I've seen about you and you know, I've read your stuff, this is you, you know, I can tell just by the stuff that you've said to me that you do genuinely care. And then he ended up working with me. And it wasn't like a marketing line. It's like, 
if you're a client of mine, I, I, you know, even though it's X amount of time ago, I still care to see where you are right now because that's important to me. You bet. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's quite that's quite different. Well, that was really cool, John. Would you come back another time and talk to me about something else? Sure, I would love it. Absolutely, especially if your if your guests, uh, you know, get value out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, there, no doubt about it. I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Judith. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with John as much as I enjoyed having it. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, an international online radio host, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. (laughs)